let's get to the early suffragette movement. And we can date it, we can date it as, as certainly with the document, and I brought it with me, and it's the 1848 July, I wish it were July 4th, but it's not. It's close enough that it's July. It's July of 1848. You know, that a few hundred women and a few dozen men gathered in Rochester, New York, and they, they issued the Seneca Falls Declaration. And it is, I'm just going to read you a little bit of it. It's their Declaration of Independence. Now, they got great press because the, the press came to ridicule these, well, they were referred to as he-she's. Now, these are frustrated women that wish they were men. And in quotes, he-she's, that they are Amazons. They're obviously in unhappy marriages, or if they're not married, that's the problem. They ought to be married. They need a guy around, <laughs> and, you know, to keep them on the straight and narrow. And what was done, it, this is brilliant. I'll share it with you just a little bit. It is brilliant. They copied, they, they modeled their Seneca Falls Declaration on the words, on the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. You know, it's terrific. It's calling out the men, you know, that we are, <laughs> we are we the people also. And, and we know, don't we, that this goes back time out of mind. You know, that the, um, you know, that democracy is a male sport. You know, it's a male blood sport. That it's it's male democracy. And you women ought to be pleased that we keep you out of this. Yeah, you know, this is dirty, messy politics, and it's all a guy thing. And and we want to keep you on that pedestal and that you keep the home and hearth safe and warm and inviting. And you want to be grateful, you know, that we you know that we do this for you. That that this is a that this is just messy, messy business. And of course the response for many of the suffragettes would, suffragettes would be, yeah, this is messy, sweaty, dirty business, right, yeah, but we live with you guys every day, <laughs> and you're messy and sweaty and dirty, what's the difference between politics and Sunday afternoon, you know, watching the football game, they would never say the football game, obviously, and by the way, Thanksgiving, the, w the way we celebrate it, it's about football, food, and then you pass out, right? Uh, tryptophan kicks in. Those turkeys have all been drugged, you know, but nobody's told us. This is great. I just want to share just a few of the words with you. The opening, when in the course of human events, this is, this is the ladies, July 1848, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and of nature's gods entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. Now, if you recall with me, the Declaration of Independence, and we've done the Declaration in, in many different contexts. When they went after the king, when they, to, to de-king the king, to attack the king, to un, to un-king the king, the, the third portion of that Declaration was quite specific. He, 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 nailing the king, outing him, if you will, that he cannot hide behind Parliament cannot hide behind his robes, cannot hide behind his title. That's why it's he, he, he. And the ladies turn their fire on he, on the guys. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, right? not the king, on the part of man toward woman having a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Remember that phrase? That's right, lifted, that's Jefferson. You know, they've, they've pirated Jefferson. Let facts be submitted to a candid world. And I always make the point that these are Jefferson's facts, but here are the ladies' facts. Bang. He has never permitted her to exercise 
her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she has no voice. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men. Is that right? Yes. To the most yes. ignorant and <laughs> degraded men. Uh, what else has he done? He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. He has taken from her all rights and property, even to the wages she earns. He has made her morally an irresponsible being, as she can commit many crimes with impunity, provided they be done in the presence of her husband. And it goes on and on and on. It's wonderful. It is an all-out assault on, on the power franchise, you know, on a male democracy. And this, this early, these early suffragettes were part, now this, they're part of a very broad reform movement. This does not fall out of the sky, you know, by itself. It's attached to a very broad reform movement in the 30s, in the 1830s, in the 1840s. And that reform movement was sparked by, uh, not too far from here, the, the Cambridge Concord connection, and that's transcendentalism. You know, the divine spark. <coughs> the men and women are good, that they are intuitively good, naturally good. And that acceptance, that transcendental spirit, that we all have a spark of the, of the humanity in us, of the divinity in us, and that those transcendentalists, utopian communities, we need to work with reform schools, uh, improvement in education, the, the abolitionist movement. I mean, the abolitionist movement went right to the front of the class, didn't it? There were so many hundreds of men, women rather, involved in the abolitionist movement that they saw their freedom, if you will, as tied into the freedom of black men and women. I mean, it's a very short bridge and a narrow bridge from abolitionism to, to the elective franchise. And, and we know, don't we, that there were so many traditionalists who believed that you know, women, you know, women speaking publicly and wearing those bloomers, you know, those seductive form-fitting bloomers, <laughs> please, how, how outrageous, you know, that they, these, these hoop skirts, and these women would say these hoop skirts are there to, to uh, prevent us from mobility. We can't even get up a flight of stairs without a man helping us. And so we have to you know, walk like Frankenstein, you see. So we're going to wear the bloomers. We're, and my goodness, what a, well, what a sensual outfit to, to be wearing. And what man would allow his wife to appear in public dressed like that? And to, and to speak from a platform, you know, you know oh, what, what is the world coming to? So, the, so the, this suffrage movement got tied up with the broader reform movements of the, of the 1830s and the 1840s. With the outbreak of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, I'm back to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln promised the ladies, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I mean, that's a, that's a major name here. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and, and also Susan B. Anthony. You know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I don't know where she found the time. Not only was she married, you know, she had seven children, and, and she, which is, you know, a handful, and she and um, Susan B. Anthony, I mean, clashed over this. I mean, they, they, were, the, uh, they were the point women here, and, and, and Susan B. Anthony said, I am never going to get married because all it does is restrict me. It inhibits me. I become the property of a man, if you will. And she was always, she became annoyed with, uh, with, 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 Susan, with, um, with, with Chapman because she was always, she could only travel locally. Uh, she, around New York. I have seven children. You know, I have a husband. I have all these domestic responsibilities. I have these spousal responsibilities. So there was this tension and most women want to know part of voting. We've got enough to do. It's a beastly male business to begin with. We have enough to do. So even among you know, the ladies that these, these suffragettes were seen as being you know, a, a, bit, a bit ahead of the curve, a quite a bit ahead of the curve. I'll tell you, Stanton got in big trouble. She wrote, 
the Stanton Bible, and she gave it a female spin, and she said, the Bible, it's written by men. Uh, and and uh, and are you all are you at all surprised that the men that wrote the Bible pinned everything on Eve? You know that everything was fine until Eve, Eve got uh, Eve fell to the temptation of the devil, and the apple, and Adam was minding his own business, just minding his own business, probably watching Monday Night Football, <laughs> and suddenly Eve shows up and and she knows she's in trouble. And written by a man. Hey, Adam, you want to see something? <laughs> uh, hey, hey, big fella, you want to see something? Take a bite of this. And, of course, there we have it, right? And, oh, she rocked the country. This was so irreligious, godless, to turn the Bible against the men. And say, it, it's the men, it's these prophets who put it, pinned it all on Eve. The, the weaker vessel, you see. Good stuff, isn't it? I like it. I like it. It's good stuff. Quick quick joke. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. Real quick. Adam and Eve, they're alone in the Garden of Eden. You know, and, and Adam's doing his business. He's, you know, he's polishing the car. I don't know, whatever he's doing. And you know, he's, he's, you know, he's looking around for Eve. And uh, where, where's Eve? Where's Eve? And he has this sniffling and this weeping and... You know, Eve, 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 what's the matter, Eve? What's the matter? And Eve looks up at him with that long, flowing blonde hair and those big, wet blue eyes. He says, Adam, Adam, do you really love me? And Adam says, Eve, who else? <laughs> it's a little, a little twist, okay? It's a little twist. With the outbreak of the Civil War, you like it. You thought I lost my way. You know, that, that Lincoln asked the women, and, and again, women, Clara Bart, nursing and so forth, and, and, and supporting the Union, and all the good work that the, you know, the women in an early way were doing to support you know, the war, and, and Mary Lincoln, too, being part of this, obviously. You know, that Lincoln spoke to the, to the now the next generation of, these, of the suffragettes. Support the war. You know, put this right to vote on hold for now. And I promise you, the first order of business, the first order of business will be I will support an amendment to the Constitution to give women the right to vote. And they agree to that. I mean, the war, you know, I mean, the war supersedes our interests. So they support the war. They drop the, you know, they drop the, not they don't drop it, but they put it on the back burner for, you know, for the, an amendment to the Constitution. But Lincoln dies. Lincoln's assassinated. He doesn't die. Lincoln's killed in action. And he is. He's killed in action. And, and the word is now that, well, you know, you're going to have to wait. This is, and here's the phrase that was used. You know, it's the Negro's hour. And, and this was part of that, that blend, that uh, trifecta of three Civil War amendments, 13 and 13, you know, the end of slavery, 14, uh, to make to make all citizens born here, uh, the, uh, citizen, uh, men, men and women citizens, due process, you know, equal protection of the law, and the 15th, you know, the right to vote for black men, people, uh, and, and you're going to have to wait. And that really put everything on hold for the longest time until we have the third generation of suffragettes. And, and this is going to give us this third generation, and don't let me forget to tie this in. It's always good to make connections. That we, you know, on Sunday, you know, we celebrated 11 11 at 11 a.m., didn't we? Boy, was it cold. It's, I, would, I thought I was speaking indoors. I was speaking outdoors. An hour and a half. I didn't talk for an hour and a half, but I was hanging around waiting for, you know, all these rifle details to be shooting and so forth. And I'm freezing. I got a little thin suit on. So there was this big guy that's had too many donuts. He was the size of a piano. And I said, could I use you as a wind buffer? And he was fine. He said, sure, I'll be your wind breaker. I said, excellent. I said, I'm freezing. 
So in any event, in any event, the uh, you know the legacy the, the legacy of, of World War One will be the Nineteenth Amendment and the Eighteenth Amendment. You know, prohibition of the right to vote. I'm going to go right to that, the Nineteenth Amendment, in, in a moment. So we're in the third generation of suffragettes, and and the war comes. You know, the war comes, and well, to the to the United States. You know, in April of 1917, and the first Rosie the Riveters were of World War One. I. I mean, they, these women went into the factories and they they, they worked on war material, war production. Uh, they worked to some extent in the shipyards. They certainly worked in the factories as well. And the the third generation of suffragettes, you know, had hit the ground running. And and I want to give you a name that most people don't recall. And her name is Alice Paul. And, and Alice Paul was a Quaker. Alice Paul weighed 95 pounds. Alice Paul was 4'10", and she was an absolute pistol. This is the time, you know, that we need to make our move now, that we are contributing once again, you know, to the war effort. And Woodrow Wilson, elected in 1912, November, had made the same pitch to the ladies that Lincoln had you know, support the war, and when the war is over, I, you know, we'll see about an amendment to the Constitution to provide you with the right to vote. And it's Alice Paul and the others who are far more militant. You know, we, we were duped in 1865, you know, half a century ago, and we are not going to back off now, that we are going to work the war and the suffragette, suffragette movement at, at the very same time. Before the outbreak of the war, however, Alice Paul and many others have gone to a seminar, if you will. I mean, Great Britain was in the midst of granting women the right to vote. And Emmeline Pankhurst, if you know that name, Emmeline Pankhurst, what a pistol, what a radical. And Alice Paul and others went to study a tutorial under the English system, under the English way of getting the right to vote. And what an eye-opener. Uh, they weren't docile, they weren't filing petitions, they weren't being pleasant, they were being Amazons. <laughs> Alan Pankhurst, this is how you get things done, you see. And, and she's, what she's doing is, she didn't use this, I'll use it for her. You know, the idea of Socrates, that if you want reform, this is Socrates. You, know, if you, 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 need, to, you need to sting, you know, you need to sting like a fire ant. You need to sting like a greenhorn so that you get a response. Petitions and speeches and being polite and yes sir and no ma'am get you nowhere. You need to sting. And when you sting, you get results. Emily, Emily Pankhurst, we are going to sting. So what they would do, they began, and Paul's going to bring this back in other words, what, what the Civil Rights Movement will do in the 1960s and that's direct action protest. We're taking it to the streets. We want to be noticed. We're going to march in England. In England, the women would march. They would carry signs. They wore uniforms. They went into Parliament, and they heckled the prime ministers from the galleries. Must have been great stuff. I mean, heckling the prime ministers. They would get on buses, and they would heckle prime ministers if they were traveling on the bus that they burned down men's clubs. Uh, I mean, that's a felony. You go to jail for this. My favorite, my favorite, you know how the Brits, the Scottish like golf? So what the women would do is they would sneak out on the golf course at night, let's say before like on a Friday night, before the guys tee up on Saturday morning, their foursome, and they would dig big gopher holes <laughs> in the greens. Oh and, and, and can't you see these fellows coming out to tea at 9 a.m. saying, like, oh, Jocelyn, these ladies have been here again. Look at this, how dreadful, how terrible. And, and, and Alice Paul was a pistol. I like this. You know, you, you, you stay, you get results. We're not going away. So she brings back, you know, all of that tutorial experience. And now the war breaks out. And as I said, women are going to the factories. They're, 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 they're in the hospitals and so on and so forth. And let's keep pushing for the, for the right to vote. And, you know, Woodrow Wilson made the pitch, as I said, that, that Abraham Lincoln had made. Let's wait until after the war. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And they, 
And they did enough. They, they played back to Wilson, if you will, almost like playing back the Declaration of Independence. When Woodrow Wilson, when Woodrow Wilson campaigned in 1916 for re-election, he campaigned on the slogan, he kept us out of war. The women turned that on Wilson. He kept us out of the voting booth. They referred to him as Kaiser Wilson, as opposed to Kaiser Wilhelm. You know, he didn't like that. I mean, I mean Woodrow Wilson was a very refined, educated guy. And his sec the second Mrs. Mrs. Wilson didn't like it either, you know, that these women, you know, are acting like this and, and, and calling my husband, you know, my guy, you know, Kaiser Wilhelm and Kaiser Wilson. And, and Wilson said, it's okay, you know, it's okay, you know, this will all, this will all pass away and, and but, it, but it, you know, it, it, it did not. And in 1916, when Wilson showed up for his inaugural parade, and, well, for being sworn in to be followed by the inaugural parade, nobody was there to greet him at Union Station. They're all downtown. Alice Paul had organized an enormous parade on the eve of Wilson's, Wilson's second inaugural to bring attention to this, because the press is in Washington, and there were thousands of women who lined up, and, and uh, the, the, the leader of the pack were on horseback, white horses, Alice Paul on a white horse with a white gown, and the first row of marchers, white gowns, the purity of our cause, a purple sa sash, that we are royalty, we are royalty, you know, to the man of war, and wearing gold crowns, you know, white, gold, and purple. It sounds like I'm doing a... Uh, play-by-play play on a football team, right? You know, purple trousers and or purple pants and white shirts. And, and here they are parading by occupation. And black women were included, but they had to march at the back. All right, they had to march. They brought up, they brought up the rear. And, and Wilson, where is everybody? Where is everybody? And what was particularly annoying for Wilson, the bleachers had been set up along Pennsylvania Avenue you know, for people to sit and watch the inaugural parade. Well, here are all these women sitting on the bleachers, you know, watching each other parade, and guys watching as well. And that's where the trouble started. See, the bars hadn't been closed, which is always a problem, you know? And these women, you know how it is. Maybe you don't know how it is. They've had a couple of pops. And these women are marching, look at them. Look at them, you know, with their um, horseback and their white, gowns on and so proud, so full of themselves, and Amazons, they're all Amazons. So the guys began to walk in among the marchers, and they had long stick pins, like darning pins, and they began to stick the darning pins into the butts of the horses. And they began to take the darning pins and stick them into the thighs and arms of the ladies and pull their bloomers up over their heads and throw firecrackers. And it created a complete bedlam, absolute bedlam. The Helen Keller took a fist right in the face. And um, she, obviously she never saw it coming, but uh, somebody really, I didn't mean it that way, you know, but obviously, I mean, somebody wound up and gave her a good shot, you know, right in the face. And the cops did nothing. They stood by and watched. They enjoyed it. You brought this on, ladies. Yes, you have a permit to march, but you should have brought protection with you. You brought this on. What are you doing here? This is not the way women act. This is the way Amazons act. And the word got back to the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, that Pennsylvania Avenue, there's a complete riot there. You know, these women are being assaulted by these drunken men. And he sent in the United States Army to settle it and to clear the streets. So talk about something getting out of control. But we're not going away. You know, we're going to sting and sting and sting. We're not going away. And Wilson, you know, in 1916, the, you know, you know Wilson, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, I mean, his, Wilson's a Democrat. Uh, Charles Evans Hughes, Wilson's Republican opponent, had come out in support of an amendment, you know, for women's suffrage. 
And Wilson was kind of pushed into it a little bit to whatever weasel words he used, I can't recall them now, that, you know, I'll consider it, yes, this perhaps is part of the legacy of a war, and, and so on and so forth. So Wilson is beginning to consider it, and what really pushes him, in 1916, the women organized, and they went out and they campaigned against Democrats who did not support a, an amendment to the Constitution for the right to vote. Now, this was unheard of women campaigning against Democrats across the country. What's your position on, um, we'll give it a number, it would be the number, the 19th Amendment. Well, I'm not quite sure, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it under advisement. Let me think about it, oh really? At the end of the day, Wilson said, these women cost me 30 house seats. Sounds familiar, huh? <laughs> <laughs> these women cost me 30 house seats in 1916. What are they doing? This is not appropriate. And, and, and all I, if, if I could only invite them in for some tea and chat with them about this, and nobody, really? You're going to put us off like that? Invite us in for, for tea? Wilson's daughters, he had two or three daughters, were very much in, in favor of the 19th Amendment. Now, that had to cause trouble at home, don't you think? Dad's really not in favor. He's dragging his feet. Mother is not in favor. And I can see the daughters wandering around in the family quarters. I hope they were humming the Marseille. You know, <laughs> that'd be terrific. I don't need this. I'm at war here. And now these women have cost cost me 30 seats in the House of Representatives. And and and, and Wilson, we've got to get this amendment out of the. We have to get this amendment out of the out of the Senate, out of the House, and out and out to the states. See, many of the Western states. Many of the western states had given the women the right to vote in the state. It wasn't national. And the western states, Utah and Nevada, and the reason for that, well, there were two reasons. One, you know, that, that the, I mean, you know, in, in, in Montana and Utah and so forth, and we're, we're talking about 1870, 1880, you know, that these women could dig a well. They could put up a fence. That they could get into the harness and, and pull a plow or, or, or direct the horse, or, or they know how to handle a how to handle a pistol, how to handle a rifle. They help subdue the land, and we also need them because if we're going to move from the status of territory to state, we need 60,000 citizens. So we're going to make sure you're a citizen, then you have the right to vote, because your numbers are on the way to statehood. So there was some movement there, but we want a national amendment in the Constitution. And they began to really put pressure on Wilson, 1917, 1918, into 1919, uh, they begin to picket the White House. I mean, to picket the White House. And Wilson found it amusing, and the cops left them alone. And once it rains, we get a little cold weather, they'll all go away. Well, they did. They did, with a little cold weather, and a little snow, what they did was they simply, they had barrels with fires going in them to keep warm and to put bricks in them. And they would stand on the bricks to keep their feet warm. And they became a tourist attraction. People visiting Washington would come and have a photograph, you know, with these, you know, with these Amazons. It was, look at these women. They're not going away. They're picketing the White House. Wilson didn't find that amusing at all. You're picketing the White House? Let's have them arrested. Arrested for trespassing. Arrested not for trespassing, for blocking traffic. Now they weren't blocking traffic. I mean, they're standing, the White House, they're standing by the gates of the White House. We're gonna arrest them for blocking traffic. Three days in jail. And that'll take care of it. Well, guess what? Bang, the same number we're back again. You know, these sisters, sisters, sisters are doing 72 hours in jail. I'll take her spot, I'll take her spot, I'll take her spot. <coughs> we really need to crack down even more. Who's the ringleader of all of this? Alice Paul. No, we're not going to arrest her. If we arrest her, we're going to make a martyr out of her. Leave her alone. We'll make an absolute martyr out of her. But we'll arrest the women around her. And then when the open fires appear, this is, this is a hazard. 
This is dangerous. This is an open fire in the presence of the White House. This is intolerable. So now we're going to toss you in jail for a couple of weeks. And more women and more women and more women. It reminds me of that scene in, in Gandhi. Remember that scene where you know, they're walking up and being struck down by the British officers? and they hit hitting with clubs and one goes down and another and another and another six walk up and another six walk up and they get their skulls crushed and then another six come up you know that uh, after a while it gets embarrassing you know we can't be arresting all of them let's get Alice Paul now when these women were arrested and they were put in solitary and they tried to sing together to pray together. We need to isolate these women. And we need to, well, we need to gag them so they can't sing, they can't talk. We need to, a little half hour of punishment, string them up on the, um, on the on tippy toes, you know, against the, uh, the, the, uh, the door of the jail. String them up for 30 minutes. You know, stretch out your arms. That'll make you uncomfortable. You get, and the food, the food was terrible, bugs in it. It was just awful, awful, awful treatment. And some of the guards began to leak out, began to, if you will, began to, they began to talk outside about what's going on in here. You have no idea what's going on inside here. We need to tell you, we need to blow a whistle on this. We need to be whistleblowers. And then they got Alice Paul. You know, we're gonna arrest Paul. And they put her in St. Elizabeth's Hospital you know, which was a psychiatric ward. And her problem, her problem is that she is so emotionally attached to Woodrow Wilson. See, all of this, she's in love with Woodrow Wilson, and she wants his attention. And the way to get attention is have all these women, I can't make this up, you know, pick at the White House, you know, and she's behind it, because she wants the attention of Wilson. He's been married twice, I'll be your third bride. And they put her in a straitjacket. She refused to eat. They force fed her, you know, three times a day. And that word got out, you know, that Alice Paul, you know, this diminutive Alice Paul, you know, is being just brutalized, you know, in this psychiatric unit to break her. As I said, Wilson was an educated guy. This is bad public relations, bad. You know, and they had a case, and they're willing to go to jail. They're willing to be force-fed. They're willing to be strung out on the, uh, uh, just to be stretched on the, uh, on the door of the jail cell, and to be gagged, and to be fed this awful food. Uh, time has come. Maybe this is the right thing to do now. So Wilson squeezes the 19th Amendment out of the Senate, out of the House, and it goes out to the states to be ratified, state by state by state. And we've talked about this before, when the framers drafted the Constitution, they made it quite difficult to amend the Constitution by design. How difficult? An amendment needs two-thirds of a House vote, it needs two-thirds of a Senate vote, and then it goes out to the states to be ratified. And it requires a supermajority. Three-quarters of the states have to approve an amendment to get it in the Constitution. Let me give you those numbers again. Two-thirds in the House, two-thirds in the Senate, out to the states, federalism, three-quarters of the states must approve it. And the, the framers of the Constitution did this deliberately so that the Constitution would not be amended, you know, for frivolous reasons. And that we did not want, the, if you will, uh, more text of amendments than the word text, text of the Constitution. Over 11,000 amendments have been proposed to the Constitution, you know, as of this morning. Uh, 27 have been passed. And if you subtract the Bill of Rights, the first 10, you know, we're down to 17. So they did their job and they did it well to make it difficult. But it's politics, it's pressure. We're losing seats in the House and the Senate because of you ladies. And because you have the right to vote in some states. So Wilson's, Wilson is able to, um, you know, to, to nudge it out of, the, out, out of the Congress, and it goes out to the states. And now the ladies are going to lobby 
the lawmakers in the states of Connecticut and Massachusetts. Massachusetts ratified in the summer of 1919. Uh, but it wasn't that easy. And we are going to lobby the men. We are going to lobby the lawmakers. And we need certain guidelines to do this. And they laid out the guidelines. Do not close the door. Don't let the guy get, don't let the, the senator or the house member close the door on you. Keep the door open. You've got a line of retreat. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Keep the door open. Do not wear provocative clothing. Do not wear makeup and perfume. And get a three by five card for talking points. Um, what, a, what is the senator's hobby? Or lawmaker or a house member, you know, what does he like to do? What's his hobby? Find out the position of his wife on the on the nineteenth amendment. We'll give it a number. Does he have daughters? Find out the position of his daughters on this amendment. You know, put pressure on this guy. Where's your family? What are your hobbies? And 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 the big pitch. This is a moment to make history, Senator. Do you years from now, a hundred years from now? Do you want people to say that you were at the, the point of the arrow, that you were part of making history, or you were a naysayer? You pulled in the other direction. Join us. Make history. This is the right thing to do now. And I look forward to your support. Thank you for your time, Senator. And the, the door is open. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Don't be provocative. Don't be loud. Don't be loud. Be persuasive you know, play to his sentiments to do the right thing. This is the right thing to do now. The time has come. And please be part of this. Help us make history. So it begins to move through the states. They need 36. And slowly, state by state, you know, coupling together. We've got one, we've got 12, and we've got 35. One more, and we're over the top. They thought they had it with Connecticut, which you would think would be Connecticut down. Then they thought they had it with Vermont, Vermont down. And now all eyes focused on Tennessee. And the movement came into Tennessee. I mean, the trains carried the women to Tennessee with the signs to be on the streets around the state house, and the votes coming to Tennessee. There was a freshman lawmaker. His name was Harry Burns. And as the vote is being announced, and you know, as they're calling the roll, you know, I, I, nay, 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 I, 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 nay, Harry Burns. And it took a while for this vote to come down. I mean, Harry Burns, a freshman lawmaker, is looking at the tote board. And it looks like it might come down to my vote. My one vote might carry the day. And there's a wonderful piece. It's a PBS series. It's called One Woman, One, 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 woman, one Vote. And Harry Burns' mother is a suffragette. He lives at home. <laughs> Thank you. That's where I'm going. He lives at home. And, and you watch it. I know it's coming. We all know it's coming. He thinks he knows what's coming. And there, you know, there are there are pages moving around. There always are, you know, passing notes and so forth. And at the end of the aisle, a page delivers a note, and and it goes down to Harry, Henry, and it's coming to him. And the note read, you know, "Make your mother proud of you. Make your mother proud of you." Is that great pressure? Uh, I. And it, and it passes. But only American history, well, I'm sure European history does that, but only in America do things like this. That Ma, and he's like, she does my laundry. <laughs> she fixes my lunch. I've got to go home tonight. Make your mother proud of you. So Tennessee, Tennessee, who would think Tennessee at 36 put it over the top? And that 19th Amendment is one of the legacies of World War I, because it got tied up you know, with the war and so on and so forth. And the other legacy of, that, of, that, of, of World War I 
and I want to mention this since we just had the armistice, well, 100 years ago, is the 18th Amendment prohibition, which is the very kind of an amendment that the framers would never have wanted in the Constitution, that we have no right to determine how many glasses of wine you have. But I'll tell you how that got in the, in the, uh, in the Constitution. It got tied up with the war as well. It also got tied up with the 16th Amendment, that beer drinking is a German custom, you see, and we're at war with Germany. And think for a minute, Miller, Pabst, Bud Weiser, and by the way, the proper pronunciation is Bud Weiser, W's of V's, so we've anglicized it, Budweiser. So drinking beer, and in a broader sense, consuming alcohol, beer drinking, is a German custom. We are fighting Huns, and we can use the cereal grains for bread products and flour to feed the troops. If we can make, if we can get that 18th Amendment on the books. So it's tied in, you know, with the war and being patriotic. I mean, all that it did, all the 18th Amendment did, is turn a nation of law-abiding citizens eventually into lawbreakers. Because, but that's part of, the, part of the, the, the legacy of World War I that we don't think about. The 18th Amendment and Prohibition, uh, speakeasies, and, and the 19th Amendment. You know, so there we have it this morning, you know, a little bit of a, ver not a little bit, you know, but a, an overview of post holding of that 19th, that 19th Amendment and, and the spread of democracy. And if one looks at the, you know, what, an interesting, yeah, one of the, one of the uh, very, uh, a course that I work through on a, on a short basis is I do a series on the, the Civil War Amendments and then a series on the progressive amendments, and then a series on the democratic amendments. You know, and each, each of which, each of these, these trios, you know, have certain characteristics and they're driven by certain historical events. Nothing happens out of context. I mean, everything gets connected up. And the only way to teach history properly is to connect the dots, isn't it? And those dots don't always line up. You know, they're not always vertical or horizontal. You know, you need to cheat a little bit. You need to move that dot there, and that dot's there, and that dot's over there. But when you step back, you can find patterns. So we can find patterns, certainly, you know, in the suffragette movement, beginning with the reform movement of the, of the 1830s, transcendentalism, and being and, and hooked in with abolition, and, and, and Lincoln saying, your time is coming, and then the Civil War members get in the way. And now the ladies are saying, three generations later, we're not falling for that again. We're not going away. You know, we'll support the war, and we want you to support the amendment because we're supporting the war. You know, we're in the hospitals. You know, we're in the factories, and we're in the trenches in another way. And and that's what and that what makes I think anyway. You know, our history. So it's it's human. It's a human story, isn't it? It's our story. It's a story of us. And, and I know there are deep historical forces that work as well. And one is the spread of democracy and humanitarianism. You know, but also when you, you, know, you, you get these big arcs and you can see here's something, here's something, here's something. You see the turn? You, know, you see the education? Do you see how this book influenced people? It works, doesn't it? So let me stop for a moment. Question, observation. Maybe, maybe somebody has a good joke. <laughs> I just wanted to mention. Pardon me? What about Abigail Adams to John Adams about remember the ladies? She's and, a pistol too. Yeah. And she wasn't alone. And here's a woman, Abigail. Boy, did she. She knew her guy. And she knew that her guy needed publicity and he needed to be recognized. And when she sent that letter in March, uh, when she said, John. Not only did she, did she say, say, John, remember the ladies, but the other word that she used, the other phrase is, all men would be tyrants if they could be. And tyrant was the buzzword against George III. Mm -hmm. Tyrant, tyrant, tyrant. He, he, he. Seneca Falls. He, he, he. And what she was speaking to is that for women to have the right to own property, to make a will, to be able to divorce, I mean, a woman could not divorce in the 18th century. She moved out, and she had to fend for herself. 
and she had no custody rights. The man had the children. So to own property, to be able to write a will. And that's what she was talking about as well. Abigail was not looking to be a selectman. She was looking for economic rights, political rights, uh, legal rights, to be able to serve on a jury. That's Abigail. And the Abigail, uh, when Abigail wrote her will, and I just want to mention this, uh, Abigail had no business legally writing her will at all, but she wrote it because she knew that John would honor it. Even though, even though it had no standing in law, because it hadn't been notarized, it hadn't been, if you will, signed off by an attorney, but she knew that John would honor her last wishes. And that will is there, and she gave money, you know, to some of her grandchildren, and jewelry, and items that she purchased in France when, and in England, when she and John went to France and England after the Revolution. And, and he took care of that. And he did it, and she knew that he would do it. Because she knew her guy. It's always important to know your guy, you know, and, uh, and to how far you can stretch him, you know, and, and, and what he'll do. And John, and I'll close with how far, and, and John, when Abigail passed, Abigail passed him in 1818, eight years before John did. And John was really crippled up. I mean, he, uh, he was crippled up. I mean, he had bad, bad legs, you know, bad, bad knees, bad hips, and he was on crutches. And the custom was, as it is today, you know, that we, with the, you follow the hearse to the cemetery, and there's a procession of automobiles, right? They call for the cars, don't they? You know, the Highlander car, the Highlander car, the Highlander car. When they call for the Highlander calls, there are eight Highlanders. So it's the Highlander car, the Highlander car, the Highlander car. And I go first, because I'm Alpha. All right? <laughs> they know that. They know that. My brothers know that. I'm Alpha. All right? And they know that. And it's okay. They respect Alpha. And we all get along famously. It's, it's good. We remember each other's birthdays as well. We phone each other. No emails. That's cheap, right? Cheap. Send me a card. Call me. Don't email me. That's the easy way out. Make an effort. That's me being John Adams. So John Adams, the tradition was that the coffin is placed on the back of a wagon and taken to the cemetery across the street adjacent to the, to the church. And people walk. Today they ride. They walk behind the wagon. And, and a carriage pulled up for John because he was so lame, he could barely walk. And he said, no, I'm going to walk. The, the, the last act of devotion to my beloved Abigail is I want to walk. And, and, and he just pulled himself. You know, it's like he's doing cross-country skiing. He's just pulling himself, pulling himself. And my last act of loyalty, love, devotion to my beloved Abigail and he told her when she was in a coma, Abigail, and he writes this in his, speaking of Abigail, since you brought her up, she's terrific, okay? She was tough. She was tough. And, and, and John writing in, in his diary, as you remember, he's sitting on the edge of the bed, and Abigail's in a coma, and he's holding her hand and talking to her, hoping that maybe he'll get a squeeze back. And of course he didn't, but he did not, rather, but he told her, Abigail, go. It's okay. It's okay, I'll be with you shortly. And then he's asking Benjamin Franklin, send a lightning bolt and take her away. Now you say that to students, they say, what? He wants his wife to be struck by lightning? I said, you didn't get it. Let me say it again. You know, and I'll say, sometimes you really gotta lay it out. You, you can't leave an awful lot to somebody's imagination. And, and to be able to walk behind her, you know, my last, act of devotion to my beloved Abigail. You know, married over 50 years. And I think it helped the fact that he was absent half the time. <laughs> as I said, as I said, the woman's definition of retirement, twice as much husband and half the pay. All right, so I'll leave you with that. And maybe a, another thought or a question, an observation. History is rich, it's our story. It's so, it's so textured and nuanced. And the more you dig into it and the more you read it, you know, you, you have more and more aha moments. Don't you enjoy having an aha moment? I never saw that. 
I never made that connection. Wow. And then you write it down, so at least for my, at my tender age, I write it down so I don't forget. I don't want to forget that connection. That's brilliant. <laughs> What do you want? The movie. <laughs> <laughs> the movie, the suffragette that was out a few years ago about the British, was that? Um, was, was that Iron Jaws? Was that Alice Paul? You no. mean the PBS movie? No, no, it was, it was, a, it was, it was a, a commercial thing. Th yeah, it was the commercial I saw it. Yeah, it was, and it was was that I was wondering if it was that well because women died. Women it showed she was how jailed. She people lost were, her children. Um, her husband. Yeah. This one woman was thrown out of her house. I'm wondering if oh, that's this. the woman you were referring to, but you would Yeah, I'm referring to the PBS piece. No, no, I'm not. I'm, you're talking about a movie. Right, but it was, was the protagonist in the movie, the British woman. I didn't see it. Was it Emily Pankhurst? Yes, yeah, so it was Emily Pankhurst. Mm. There you go, there's your answer. They also showed <laughs> that she was just, she was, he just wasn't, he doesn't know. I brought you two together. <laughs> <laughs> I facilitated that, so, right? <laughs> Typical man taking credit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I like to be the head of the pack. <laughs> I don't know who said this. It wasn't me originally. But civilization was created by men to impress their girlfriends. Okay. So that's, okay. I, I'm sure we can get the It's called a good date. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's what it's called. It's called a good date. You go out with me once. You'll never look back. Right? You'll be wearing you'll be wearing diamonds, honey. You stick with me. I'll see you all later. Be well, and we have some homework to do. Yes. Okay. okay. I'm writing down lots of topics. Oh, oh wow, yeah, wow. Scary book for, uh, you usually call me the night before. What happened? Oh. What time's next? You were busy, year? weren't you? What time's next? Year, right. So the next one he's coming to is February. He's doing the Indianapolis. The other ones we're going to be talking about. He has his calendar in his car. You taking credit? <laughs> that was great, thank you. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.